Well, um, thanks again for the invitation to be here. It's really nice to see everybody. Um, so my goal for today is to tell you about this really beautiful combinatorial and geometric story um, that relates three mathematical objects, one from the world of moduli of curves and one from the world of combinatorics and one from the world of, of sort of group theory. Um, and, and my goal will be to tell you about the work that my collaborat collaborators and I have been doing recently um, to, to generalize that story. So I'm gonna start by um, giving you a roadmap of what the objects are in those three settings that I mentioned without for now really defining anything, um, just so you have an idea of the lay of the land, where we'll be headed. So the, the story starts with the work of Losef and Menin, um, who defined a particular moduli space of genus zero curves with weighted marked points, um, whose objects look something like this. Um, and who showed that the boundary strata in that moduli space are encoded by the face structure of a polytope called the permutahedron, um, which looks like that. And then on the other hand, from a sort of combinatorialist's perspective, the, the face structure of the permutahedron encodes something else, which is the symmetric group SN, whose objects are of course things like the cycle I've written here. Um, specifically, the permutahedron knows about how SN is generated by adjacent transpositions. So we wind up with these sort of three objects that are intimately related to each other. And then Batyrev and Bloom a little bit more recently generalized that story. They defined a, a moduli space of genus zero curves with an involution. And they showed that its boundary strata are encoded by the face structure of a different polytope that's called the signed permutahedron. And then on the other hand, they showed that that face structure relates to a group of its own, which is the group of signed permutations. So I'll tell you more about that in a bit, but, but where I'm ultimately headed is that my collaborators and I um, put that work in sort of a more general context, which is to define a moduli space of genus zero curves with an automorphism of order R. So a sample um, element that we'll be looking at later looks something like this. This is the um, the case where R is equal to three, you'd see the threefold symmetry there. Um, and we showed that the boundary strata in that moduli space are, are once again encoded in something polyhedral, but it's, it's now something a little bit more complicated. It's not a polytope, but instead is a polytopal complex, which I'm gonna call the R permutahedral complex. And I've shown a picture of that here in an example to pique your interest. Um, and then that complex in turn, again, relates to the structure of a particular group. In this case, it's the complex reflection group SRN um, that consists of all n by n matrices whose only non-zero entries are rth roots of unity and with exactly one non-zero entry in each row and column. So you see an example of such a thing right here where let's say, for example, r is equal to three and zeta is a primitive third root of unity. So, so a question about yeah. the first row. So we don't need to know, I guess I do know what the symmetric group is, but we don't need to know what the... Uh, Space you don't need to know what any of these or, things are, except yeah, maybe it would help, help to know what the symmetric group is, but the rest of it I'll define super soon. Great. Um, yeah, and so before getting there, I guess I'll just say that, that in this more general story, the R equals two case recovers the work that I briefly mentioned of Batsy, Reb, and Bloom, and the R equals one case doesn't exactly recover, but sort of morally recovers Losef and Menin's work. Um, so, okay, so that's the, the lay of the land. Um, before we start defining all that precisely, let me just tell you about the people involved. Um, so this is joint work with Chiara Damiolini, who's a postdoc at UPenn and, and is also currently on the job market. Um, with Dao Ji Huang, who's a postdoc at Minnesota. Um, with Xiu Li, who's a graduate student at Brown. And with Rohini Ramadas, who's at Warwick Math Institute. Um, and, and we started work on this project at the um, Women in Algebraic Geometry workshop that was virtually hosted by ISERM in July, 2020. So, okay, so um, let's dive in. So maybe I'll start with just why I'm interested in this story. So, so my personal interest in this comes um, from my interest in the moduli space M0N bar, which parametrizes uh, trees of CP1s equipped with a choice of N distinct ordered marked points. Um, and maybe sort of a key fact about this moduli space is that 
Um, it's not a toric variety when N is um, anything five and above, um, but it does have some of the combinatorial structure that a toric variety would have in which the torus invariant strata, sort of the, the role of the torus invariant strata is played um, by the boundary strata. So let me just tell you what I mean by this word boundary strata in case you're unfamiliar. Um, so what I mean by that is, is the closure of the locus of curves with a fixed topological type and fixed distribution of marked points. So let me tell you, define it by example. So like, let's say I was in M06 bar. Um, so this is genus zero curves with six marked points. I could look at the locus of curves that may be split into three components like this, across which the marked points are distributed as maybe marked points one and three, on the left, maybe marked point five in the middle, and maybe marked points two, four, and six on the right. So the locus of curves of that shape is a subset of M06 bar. And if I take the closure of that locus in M06 bar, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I talk about a boundary stratum. Um, and maybe just to make this sort of vague connection to, to toric geometry a little bit more precise, what I mean by, by that connection is, for example, um, the chow ring of a toric variety, as you may know, is generated by the torus invariant strata and the relations can be described combinatorially in terms of fan data. Um, and so totally analogously, the chow ring of the moduli space of curves is generated by boundary strata um, and the relations are described combinatorially in terms of dual graphs. Um, so that's kind of an intriguing connection. And the idea of Losef and Menin's work um, is to sort of tweak the moduli problem a little bit by allowing the marked points to coincide with one another in a controlled way. And if you do that carefully, you get a moduli space that actually is toric and for which the torus invariant strata actually are the boundary strata. Um, so that's the motivation. Now I think I'm gonna. Um, go ahead and define losef minion space somewhat precisely. So maybe a quick reality check for me. You've yeah. got your, so M0 N bar, not a torque variety, but you're gonna tweak the moduli functor a little bit in a second, which you're about to tell us. And yep. then now it actually will be a torque variety and all this about our, and so it all, we're not exactly getting what we want, but it is a moduli space very close and it's torque. And exactly, yep. Yeah. Perfect, thank you for that. That's a great summary. Um, so yeah, so let's try to do it. So how do we tweak the moduli problem? So I'm going to call this, this space LN bar. Um, and it again parametrizes genus zero curves with a choice of marked points. Um, but now those marked points fall into two types. So first I have marked points, which I'll call Y1 and Y2. And I'm going to disallow them from coinciding with any other marked point. Um, but then also I'll have N other marked points, Z1 through Zn. Um, and I'm going to allow them to freely coincide with one another. And I'll refer to these two possibilities as these marked points being heavy and these ones being light. So let me draw you a picture to give you a better sense of what, what these sorts of things look like. Oops, my notations just went away. I'll rewrite them. So here's a sample element of this moduli space. Maybe I just have a single genus zero component, a single Riemann sphere. Um, I've got my marked points Y1 and Y2, and then Z1, Z2, and Z3 are distributed around somewhere and they're allowed to coincide with each other. So for instance here, Z1 and Z3 are the same point. And then what happens as you sort of look around at limits inside of this moduli space? So for example, what if I sort of begin to deform this in such a way that Z2 approaches Z1 and Z3 um, in the limit as that happens, it just happens. Z1, Z2, and Z3 are all allowed to sit at the same point. Um, however, what if I, what if I deform this in such a way that Z2 approaches Y2? Um, Z2 is not allowed to coincide with Y2. And so the limit you'll see in that situation is what those of you who have worked with the moduli space of 
of usual curves before um, might expect, which is that uh, we'll get a new component um, housing the marked points that we're attempting to collide. So here, a new, a new component housing marked points Z2 and Y2. Um, so those are the things that Losef Manin space parameterizes. Um, and the, the theorem that I alluded to and, and which Ravi summarized um, is that this moduli space again is a toric variety and the torus invariant strata are precisely the boundary strata. Um, and now to begin to sort of bring in the other pieces that I mentioned on that roadmap slide, because it's a toric variety, it has an associated polytope and that polytope is the permutahedron. So next I'll tell you um, more precisely what I mean by the permutahedron um, in case you've never met that before. It's a really beautiful combinatorial object. Maybe just before you do, so if you have, um... In your original geometric space, if you have your before the thing breaks into pieces, yeah, you can see how the torus is acting cheaply. Like you have your, yeah. uh, I presume it's just a oh, oh, it's a big torus. Oh, I take back everything I said. Yeah, so, so yeah, I can tell you what the torus question, action is. Yeah, so, my question, um, my question blew up, so forget, forget it. Wait, sorry, do you want, should, should I say what the, yeah, no, no, yes, please. Okay, great, okay, perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, so, so what you can see as you sort of do these degenerations that I've mentioned here is that in fact, the, the, um, the curves in this moduli space will always be chains of P1s, not trees of P1s, um, but just, just a bunch of P1s in a, in a chain. Um, and so, so you can imagine, um, uh, using an automorphism to, to assume that that each the, the two special points on the on the ends of each of those p1s so like this one and this one for instance are zero and infinity and then there's a c star that acts on that component um, which which moves around the um, the the marked so so sorry let me say that better we're we're multiplying z1 through zn by by um by c star independently which makes sense because we've um we've located those two special points at zero and infinity i hope that was mildly coherent um anything else i can clarify or, or other questions i can answer about this space before we keep going so at this point, it is a smooth, when you say space, it, it's a smooth manifold, compact smooth manifold. Smooth yeah, manifold. yeah, or smooth, like projective variety, um, whichever you prefer. So Emily, can I think of this as something like when you said, as you said, you can sort of make the heavy points be zero and infinity. Mm -hmm. And then is this, is this the same thing as like degree and divisors on GM? I mean, those points are sort of allowed to like, be multiple and like cross each other. Um, I know they're, they're, but they're definitely when they come to uh, when it breaks into pieces. You yeah, know. like when they oh, have I heavy points, same. something hard, like so it's new geometry. I understand. That. What I said is the big torus, right? The, what I yeah. the part of it I yeah, said yeah. Has, to, it has a giant torus action or something like yeah. that, but then I didn't take into account. I got it. Cool. cool. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so just to recap where, where we are now, this is a toric variety, um, therefore it should have a polytope associated to it and claim that polytope is the permutahedron. Um, so, okay, so what's that? Um, so the permutahedron is the convex hull of the n factorial points in Rn, whose coordinates are the numbers one through n in some order. Um, so on the left here, this is a picture of the permutahedron when n is equal to three. Um, note that it lives in R3, but it's actually two-dimensional because it lives inside of the hyperplane where the sum of the coordinates is six. Um, and then similarly, the permutahedron when n is equal to four, it lives inside of R4, but it's in fact only three-dimensional. So luckily that means I can draw a picture of it or, or rather um, copy a picture from Wikipedia, um, which is what you see on the right here. So note it's got those um, 24 vertices, which are permutations of the numbers one through four. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Can I ask? Quick question about the previous slide. Yeah, uh, this one. All right, the previous one actually. Yeah. Is there some requirement about 
having like enough enough marked points on each component yeah. before you click catch? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. So there's a couple of things that I'm that I'm super sweeping under the rug here. So one is a stability condition, um, which is the condition that that every um, let's say it this way, every component needs to have um, a non-zero number of these light marked points. Um, and then there's also uh, the fact that was sort of alluded to that I'm that I'm only actually considering these up to automorphism, and so I should probably be a little bit careful about what I mean by automorphism. Okay, so um, I see. Because so in the example you've drawn, right, each of the if you include the intersection of the two components, there's three marked points on each component, right? So there shouldn't be any automorphisms of each component. But I'm wondering if if you only have like n marked points and you have a lot of components, can you start getting automorphisms that are non-trivial? I'm I'm just not I'm kind of blanking how that will. Yeah, so 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 you won't because there's this stability condition that that I'm that I'm kind of ignoring here. Um, maybe a way to think of it, if you're used to thinking about the usual moduli space of curves, is in that case we ask that each component has three special points. Yeah. Um, and you could think of those as sort of three points of weight one. Um, in this case, maybe think of think of the the heavy points as weight one and the nodes as well as weight one, but think of the the light points as as a sort of very 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 small weight. Um, and and what I'm asking is that each component has has a total weight bigger than two. So it's going to have weight two from a heavy point and a and a node, um, and then it has to have just a little bit more than that. So it has to have at least um, at least one of the light points on it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it's okay. So so when I say that um, that the that the permutahedron is the polytope associated to this moduli space. Um, what that means just from sort of a toric geometry perspective is that there's a dimension preserving and inclusion preserving bijection um, between the torus invariant strata in the moduli space and the faces of the permutahedron. That's what this statement would look like for any toric variety. But what's interesting here, as I mentioned, is that the torus invariant strata of um, LN bar are precisely the boundary strata. So the way I'd encourage you to think of what's on this slide is that we can draw a picture of the permutahedron and we can go around and label every k-dimensional face of it with a k-dimensional boundary stratum. And we can do that in an inclusion preserving way. So on the next slide, I'm gonna draw you an example just so you can get a feel for what that kind of looks like. So here's the example where n is equal to three. Remember we saw that the permutahedron in that case is this hexagon. Um, and what I've done is I've labeled at least some of the faces of that hexagon with the boundary strata of losef manin space with three light marked points. The light marked points are the ones that I've drawn in green. The, um, the orange ones are the heavy points. Um, and the, the fact that this labeling is inclusion preserving, you can see it from the fact that the boundary strata labeling the two vertices of an edge are specializations of the boundary stratum labeling that edge. So like for instance, here in the lower right, here's an edge and I've labeled it with this boundary stratum right here. And remember that that boundary stratum is defined as the closure of the locus of curves of this shape. And so included in there, we'll have the limit point where for instance, the third light marked point starts to approach that heavy one right there. And the limit in that case will look like this. Or we'll also have the limit where the first um, light marked point starts to approach that heavy one, and the limit in that case will look like this. Um, so you can go around and, and complete this labeling. If you're interested, you can find that indeed every face can be labeled in this inclusion preserving way by a, by a boundary stratum in this moduli space. So um, that's the idea of sort of the association between this moduli space LN bar and this polytope, the permutahedron. And so there's one more character I want to add to the story, which is how is all of this connected the, to the symmetric group? Um, so maybe I'll move to that. <laughs> 
Um, this is something that's maybe more familiar um, to combinatorialists. So there is a bijection, right, from the vertices of the permutahedron to the elements of the symmetric group, just because the vertices of the permutahedron are the numbers one through n, um, the, the points with coordinates one through n in some order. Um, but what's interesting about that bijection is that um, is that uh, the adjacency of vertices um, corresponds to uh, elements of the symmetric group being related by an adjacent transposition. So namely two vertices are adjacent in the permutahedron, meaning joined by an edge, if and only if the corresponding elements of the symmetric group differ by left multiplication by an adjacent transposition. That's maybe a bit of a mouthful, but here's an example. So here is again the permutahedron delta three, which is this hexagon. Um, in green, I've labeled the coordinates of each of its vertices, which are points in R3. And then in orange, I've labeled each with its associated element of the symmetric group S3 in cycle notation. And just to take an example, let's notice that for instance, like these two vertices are adjacent, meaning joined by an edge, and their associated elements of S3 are indeed related by uh, left multiplication by an adjacent transposition. In this case, it's the adjacent transposition 2, 3. And so Emily, 1 and 3, it doesn't go around like a circle, like 1 and 3 don't count as adjacent. Right. Is that right for the, correct. oh, okay. Correct, correct, yep. I see, so it's not just SN as a naked group, so to speak, right? It's not the permutations of an arbitrary set. It's the permutations of a set where they're actually labeled one through N and we know which order they. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, that... another way to say the observation you're making is that like it's it's SN like with the data of sort of how it's generated by adjacent transpositions. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. Like it's, it's yeah. And yeah. And so the very first one, the first statement about the vertices is trivial given your definition of mm -hmm. even, but the second one seems not so. Uh, totally, yeah. It doesn't seem so. But these are clearly, the adjacent transitions clearly give you edges because they're minimal length things. But why do not, right, it's not so clear at all. It's yeah. not, at least to me, I don't see a trick to make it. Clear. No, I, I don't either. Yeah, okay. I mean, I agree. I, I mean, I'm, I'm no combinatorialist. I, I, I learned all of these things in as part of this project, but to me, it's still, I, I still find this to be sort of a, a cool, non-trivial fact. And it goes, um, oh, sorry, I thought I heard a question. I, I think Adam's trying to talk, but then he's- yeah. sorry, Please go ahead, I'll, I'll say what I was gonna say. Okay, yeah, no worries. Um, so, so, so maybe I, I want to say one more thing about all of this, which is that it, it goes even sort of a step beyond um, uh, the edges, which we don't see until we bump things up the next dimension. So, in particular, a, a collection of vertices in the permutahedron span a k-dimensional face, if and only if their associated elements of the symmetric group. Um, form a, a left coset of a subgroup generated by K adja adjacent transpositions. Okay, again, a mouthful, let's look at an example. Here's the permutahedron delta four, and I've labeled a few of its vertices by their associated elements of S4. And what you can see is that these four vertices that I've chosen here, um, they span a two-dimensional face, and those four elements of S4 collectively form the elements of the coset, which is take the subgroup generated by the two adjacent transpositions, one, two, and three, four, and multiply all of those things by the single element two, three in the symmetric group. Oh, I was about to ask a question and then I'm gonna unask it because I was about to say like, Oh, do you mean like commuting transpositions? But then I see some of the faces have six and some of the faces have four. Exactly, exactly. So some of the faces are roll. squares, which is which is um, when you get you you get that when you take a, a a coset where the subgroup is two disjoint transpositions, and some of the faces are hexagons, which is when um, your two transpositions um, are overlapping. And that's the that S three. That's the permutahedron of S three that you already showed yeah. us. That's the face. Gorgeous. Yep. Exactly. 
maybe just as a reality check. Are you sitting? No, you're not saying that. Okay, it's not that they are all, the faces are not all from the heaters because the square is not. Right, heaters. exactly. But I guess they're maybe. But they're direct products signs of. of yeah, yeah, the products are from Hedra. Yep. So we've seen instance, uh, oh, sorry, line cross line. Oh. oh, I see. So so adjacent transitions, but when you say adjacent transitions, it's any collection of adjacent transitions. Exactly. And, and so you could have like a clump and a clump and a clump, and the resulting face will be a product of these various. Yep. And so exactly. it's like roots, you're like picking roots on a dink and diagram. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So to, to clarify, does this imply that every permutahedron has only two-dimensional faces, squares, and hexagons? Is that? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's true in this case because I'm drawing a, a, a three-dimensional permutahedron. But I mean, beyond the point at which I can draw, um, I'll have I'll have three-dimensional. Oh, but maybe what you're asking is, will the two D faces the 2D always be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I understand now. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, exactly. The 2D faces will either be uh, overlapping or non-overlapping adjacent transpositions, which will make them either squares or hexagons. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, and so to finish the Losef Manin story, let me introduce a bit of non-standard terminology that I personally find helpful. I'm going to refer to one of these cosets um, where I take a subgroup generated by K adjacent transpositions. Um, I'm going to refer to that as a k-dimensional t coset, um, t for transposition. Um, and with that terminology, then I can summarize everything I've told you about losef manin space by saying that there's dimension preserving and inclusion preserving bijections between now three types of things. I've got maybe I'll start in the middle here, right? So I've got the faces of the of the permutahedron on one hand, and then as we saw initially, I can label those. Um, by boundary strata of the moduli space. But now what we've now seen is that we can also label them by, by these T cosets. And I introduced this notion of dimension for the T cosets um, just so that I could say that this is a dimension preserving um, uh, bijection there. So that's kind of the summary of the whole story um, in the, in the losef manin slash permutahedron case. Um, so I'm going to now say a few words very briefly about Batyarev and Bloom's work, um, but I'm going to make it brief because then I want to leave myself time to talk about our generalization. Um, so basically Batyarev and Bloom, um, they developed an analogous story, but now the curves are equipped with an involution. Um, so namely, they, they constructed this moduli space, which I'll denote LN2, that parameterizes, again, genus zero curves. Now there's an involution, which in this picture you should view as that sort of left-right symmetry. And again, I equip these curves um, with um, marked points, but I'll, I'll require my... So let me say this better. I'm going to equip these curves with one heavy orbit of that involution, which in this picture is y plus and y minus. And in addition, n light orbits of that um, involution. So in this picture, I've got the orbit z1 plus and z1 minus. I've got the orbit z2 plus and z2 minus, and the orbit z3 plus and z3 minus. And again, those are light in the sense that they're allowed to coincide with one another. And what they proved is that this moduli space, again, is a toric variety. Um, and the torus invariant strata are, again, precisely the boundary strata. So in that case, it's a perfect analogy to what we already saw. Um, and more than that, the story is really identical to the losef manin case, but now um, the permutahedron is replaced by the signed permutahedron, um, which is the convex hull of the points in Rn, whose coordinates are the numbers one through n in some order, and each with um, a choice of a plus or minus sign. So for instance, when n is equal to two, the signed permutahedron is the octagon I've drawn here on the left. Um, and the role that was played in the previous story by the symmetric group is played by the group of signed permutations. Um, so the way to think of that is that you can view a permutation um, as a matrix with um, entries zero and one and exactly one non-zero entry in each row and column. Same thing for signed permutahedra, sorry, signed permutations, except that you um, allow the entries to be plus or minus one 
So somehow, I mean, it seems like we're replacing a n by d n. Yeah. So thanks for pointing that out. So um, uh, I think, by for my understanding, um, uh, sort of the the source of Batyev and Bloom's interest in this space is that they they constructed more generally a toric variety associated to any root system. Um, and what they proved is that if you run their construction to a type A root system, you get loss of Menin space LN. Um, and if you run it for a type B root system, you get um, this moduli space that I've just mentioned, LN2. But for them, that was sort of the end of the story because what they proved is that the toric varieties associated to the other classical root systems somehow don't really have this nice um, interpretation as moduli spaces of curves. Um, and so that was, at least as my understanding, um, sort of why they stopped there. Um, but um, what my collaborators and I did was say, you know, like, let's, let's drop this connection to root systems um, and instead keep the existence of the, the involution on the curves. Um, but now, rather than it being necessarily an involution, we'll allow it to be an automorphism of any finite order. Um, so that's where I'm going to move to now, is to tell you what, what the moduli space looks like in that generalization. Um, OK, that's what I just said. So here's the moduli space that we were interested in. I'm going to call it LNR. Um, it parameterizes again genus zero curves, now with an order R automorphism. So the picture I've drawn here is the example where R is equal to three. So the automorphism is this sort of threefold symmetry. Um, it's equipped with a choice of one heavy orbit of that automorphism, which is these points that I've labeled in orange. Um, and a choice of n light orbits. Apologies that the notation sort of gets a little bit hairy in this generality, um, but for instance, here is one of those light orbits. It's the points with lower index one and the upper index is zero, one, or two. Um, and here's another one of those light orbits. So, so before I was thinking of the two heavy points at being at zero and infinity, and right now I'm thinking of x as infinity and those y's as roots as like roots of unity uh, instead. That's yep. okay. exactly, exactly. Um, other questions I can answer about sort of the shape of this moduli space before we talk about more? Wait, I'm sorry, I did slightly get lost. The Y's are the heavy orbit and the green Z's are the white orbits, but what what is X in the description? Yeah, sorry, I probably, I, I should have erased the X because I've sort of chosen to not uh, dwell on it, but um, the X is a, is a fixed point of the automorphism. Oh, okay, but that comes from the automorphism, so it's not part of what we're parameterizing. It's exactly, just, it's not okay. part of what we're parameterizing. Oh, so it's, oh, so it's not heavy. So the X is not heavy. The Z's yeah, can exactly. cross it. Yep, oh. the Z's can cross it. The Z's can cross yeah. it, and so so you can you can in this moduli space um, think that you're parameterizing also a choice of a of a light fixed point, um, but I, I think actually that won't affect the moduli problem because I think that choice maybe comes for free once you've chosen the automorphism. But anyway, if it helps, let's think that X is a light fixed point of the automorphism. So at this point, I'm maybe expecting some overfold rather than a manifold. Is that the uh, for the? So 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 it's it's not. Um, yeah, and and I think one thing that those who are used to thinking about orbifolds often finds confusing about this moduli space is that um, you might think that this is something like stable maps to BZR or something like that, um, and and it's it's not. Um, and the reason is that I'm 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 labeling my my orbits. So so my orbits are not sort of like um, uh, just a choice of of three points, but it's a labeled choice. So it sort of matters that this this one is the zero if the first and the second. Ah, great, perfect. Thank you. That answers that perfectly explains the source of my issue. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the Hasse moduli space of you know, weighted n mark. The yeah. There is a natural regression, right? So it looks like this space can be related to. Um, okay, take a Hasse moduli space and think about the 
the cyclic group invariant locus and take yep. the, the quotient by the cyclic group. Yep. Is this space related to your moduli space? Yeah, so so this, this moduli space can be embedded inside of a Hassett space, and that, that's actually how we construct it. Um, so you're absolutely right. And um, maybe one other thing I want to highlight about what you just said is that um, there is an action of the group SNR that I mentioned briefly earlier and that I'll, I'll mention again, um, in the same way that there's a symmetric group action on M0 N bar permuting the marked points. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, okay, so um, bad news, this moduli space is not toric. Um, so it has no associated polytope. So in that case, sort of the story is broken, but in some ways I think it's it's sort of cooler because it, it has something that's kind of close to, to a polytope, which is an associated polytopal complex, um, meaning sort of a bunch of polytopes glued together along their faces. And I'm gonna call that object the R permutahedral complex, and I wanna define it for you now. Um, so define it, to, to define it, I think it's useful to revisit this signed permutahedron that we met really briefly. Um, I've defined it for you earlier as the convex hull of the points with coordinates one through n in some order, each with a plus or minus sign. So here's the n equals two case again as an example. But what I, what I want to highlight now is that we could equivalently define this by saying it's bounded by the four hyperplanes where I set some coordinate with a plus or minus sign equal to two. So like here, X1 is equal to two or minus two and similarly for X2. Um, and the four coordinates, sorry, the four hyperplanes where I set a sum of two coordinates each with a plus or minus sign equal to three. And if you sort of unpack that um, more generally, what you can get is an expression for the signed permutahedron in terms of inequalities. And it's not at all important that you parse the details of this, but what I'll highlight for you is that for any subset of the coordinates, um, we're getting an inequality on the sum of the absolute value of those coordinates. Um, and it's less than or equal to some number delta J, which I don't need to define. Um, and the, the, the key points that I just want to highlight here is that this di generalizes directly to higher R. Um, this is the R equals two case. What we'll do in general is we're going to take the real numbers here and we're going to replace them with the following subset of the complex numbers. Um, so I'm going to let Y denote um, non-negative real numbers times R roots of unity. So that looks when R is equal to three, uh, something like this, which is why I'm calling it Y. Um, and I'm going to define the R permutahedral complex as the subset of Y to the N. So in particular, this lives inside of C to the N, um, which is defined by this expression. And this is exactly the same um, expression, the same set of inequalities, as I said, said on the previous slide, except that now um, where I had R, I'm going to have y. And notice here that if r were equal to 2, then y would be non-negative real numbers times plus or minus 1, and so y would be r, um, and we would recover exactly what we had on the previous slide. Um, but in general, um, this, this delta rn is um, not a polytope as it was when r equals two, but a polytopal complex. And so to see that, let's maybe look at the, the first kind of non-trivial new example, which is when r is equal to three and n is equal to two. Um, so here it is. On the left, you see a depiction of um, that polytopal complex delta three, two, which lives inside of C squared. And I should mention that this is really beautiful and kind of MC Escherich uh, picture was created by, by my collaborator, Chiara Danielini. Um, but on the right, just to make it a little easier to parse, I've pulled out just a piece of it. So it's what I've pulled out, let's say, is kind of this piece right here. Um, and so a couple things that I, that I want to highlight. Um, so first, there are points here that are playing the role of vertices. And these are the points in CN, so in this case, C squared, whose coordinates are the numbers one through N in some order 
now each time some r root of unity. So zeta here is a primitive third root of unity. And that's just like how the vertices of the signed permutahedron were points with coordinates one through n in some order, each with a plus or minus sign. That's observation one. And observation two is that this, this polytopal complex is built by gluing together pentagons, right? Like here's one, here's a pentagon. Um, and that's not an accident. So, so, so remember the, the signed permutahedron when n is equal to two was that octagon, right? So here's the signed permutahedron when n equals two, it's an octagon in R2. And you see a pentagon showing up there as the intersection with a quadrant. And moreover, when one of the two coordinates becomes zero and then changes sign, two of those pentagons meet. And while well, the same thing happens here in this r equals three case, except that now when one of the coordinates becomes zero, it doesn't just have the opportunity to change sign, but it can be multiplied by any of the three possible third roots of unity. And that's why you see these pentagons meeting in triples rather than pairs. Um, so that's kind of a taste of what this R permutahedral complex is. Um, what I now want to try to tell you is that its face structure, at least when faces are properly interpreted in this polytopal complex context, um, that face structure really does encode the combinatorics of the boundary strata in the moduli space of curves with order R automorph automorphism. Um, but I'm going to have to be a little careful about what I mean by face. So, so yeah. So, if I, so I find myself like when you're reading. Uh, reading some Agatha Christie book and you're trying to guess what, you know, who the, like what's going to happen to yeah. tap the reader and you just want to, so, so here you can see because of your crazy, uh, uh, the thing you called why I think the thing that was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so you, so I can see the, uh, so I, so I can see that you have the SN and you have your, I can see your crazy generalization symmetric group acting on this thing. Yeah. This thing doesn't look like a, it's not a polytope, it's a crazy, uh, but this, but you could, if you were to act on it by just the roots of unities, which are these sort of different things, and by just the so not the SN part, but just the roots of unity mm -hmm. part, and quotient by that, that's the thing on which it'll have a residual SN action, and yeah. that's feeling like what Han Han Ban Moon said about the Hassett space. Like that's the thing I might dream might be a torque variety that's related to the Hassett space. So is that am I? So I I'm not question? sure that I'm fully understanding, but I think one thing that it sounds like it m might be coming out of what you're saying is like, if I, if I maybe restrict my attention to just one of these um, pentagons or, or uh, equivalently, if I, if I, if I quotient by an action that glues all of the pentagons together, um, that you can think of as um, the result of a, of a quotient of the moduli space um, and and what I'm getting when I do that quotient is my original moduli space parameterizes these sort of um, these these pictures with sort of R spokes. And what I'm parameterizing when I do that quotient is just a single spoke, which right. is a Hassett space. Great, that's good. So so great. So the geometry of torque torque geometry is here, and it's just to be excavated. From, yep. Okay, great. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, super important point. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, so okay, so if I want to, if I want to tell you about sort of the face structure of this, I should say a few words about what I mean by face. So again, going back to the signed permutahedron, um, the, the hyperplanes um, where a sum of the coordinates each times a plus or minus sign is equal to this number delta j, those are the bounding hyperplanes of the signed permutahedron. And I can think of a face as what I get by intersecting the signed permutahedron with some of those bounding hyperplanes, like this, for instance. Um, in my more general case, I can again think of hyperplanes, which I get by taking a sum of um, coordinates, each now times an rth root of unity and setting it equal to this constant. Um, those don't bound a region in, in CN, um, but still we can define uh, what I'll call a delta face um, of this polytopal complex 
to be what I get by taking the entire polytopal complex and intersecting it with a collection of those hyperplanes. Um, oh, and I see that my screen share seems to not have updated. I'm gonna stop and restart it. Sorry about that. Glad that I noticed that. Um, this, this happens sometimes with screen shares. So I'm gonna re-say what I just said because you were not seeing what I hoped you to see while I said it. Um, so again, in the case of the, um, the R permutahedral complex, I have these hyperplanes, which are given by taking a sum of coordinates, each with a coefficient, which is an R root of unity and setting it equal to some fixed number. Um, and I'm gonna define a delta face um, of, the, of the complex to be what I get by taking the complex and intersecting it with a collection of those hyperplanes. Um, and I think this is, this is maybe best seen in an example. Here's again that picture um, that we saw earlier. Um, and what you notice here is that the, the notion of, of delta face doesn't quite look how you might expect um, faces to look. In particular, each of these delta faces is itself a polytopal complex. So like in the polytope world, you'd expect a one-dimensional face to be an edge. Here, there are one dimensional faces that look like a regular old edge, like this green one, which is given by intersecting with this hyperplane. But then there are also one dimensional faces that are Y shaped like this and are adjacent not to two vertices, but to three vertices. Um, this one is defined by intersecting with this hyperplane. And that behavior of edges might seem very weird, but it's actually exactly how the boundary strata in this moduli space behave. Um, so in particular, um, there are some one dimensional boundary strata like this green one I've drawn down here um, that have just two different specializations. So I've, I've very abbreviated what I mean here, but here what I mean is that I've got two light orbits on the um, external components. And there's two different ways that that picture could degenerate because either this light orbit or this light orbit um, could bubble off onto a new external component. And those two possibilities are gonna give me the two adjacent vertices here. On the other hand, there are other sorts of one dimensional boundary strata like the one I've drawn in pink here where I've got one light orbit on the external components and another light orbit all on the central component. Now that can degenerate in three different ways because the three elements of that central orbit can bubble off towards the spokes in three different ways. Um, and that's what's giving me the three adjacent vertices here. So that's a very little taste, but what I wanna sort of suggest by this picture is part of our main theorem that I'm gonna state precisely in a second, which is that the, the, the delta faces of this R permutahedral complex can be labeled by the boundary strata of the moduli space LRN in this dimension preserving and inclusion preserving way. I was confused about the combinatorics on this picture. So they yeah. used all of those six marked points are right ones, right? You didn't draw heavy. Ones. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. So, so gotcha. really Thanks. what I should have also included in here is that at the, and I typically tend to not draw these because they always live um, on the ends of the, the spokes, but you're absolutely right. You should imagine that each of these has a heavy marked point at the end. So I'm just about ready to state that main theorem, um, but maybe before I state that, um, what I should briefly mention is that just like we saw that losef manin space is connected to the symmetric group and bathrop bloom space is connected to this group of signed permutations, um, this story again relates to a group and that's kind of the easy part of the story because it directly generalizes the previous cases. 
Um, so the group is SRN, it's the group of N by N matrices, um, all of whose entries are either zero or rth roots of unity. And there's exactly one non-zero entry in each row and column. So again, here, if you picture zeta as a primitive third root of unity, here's an example of, of such a thing. Um, and that group, it's not hard to see, is generated by this set, which I'll call T, which consists of um, the adjacent transpositions in the symmetric group. So where the entries are just zeros and ones, um, together with one additional element, which is the matrix, which is basically the identity matrix, except that in the upper left-hand corner, um, I have a primitive third root of unity. Um, so this is the set that's sort of playing the role in this group that adjacent transpositions would play in the symmetric group. Um, and I'm going to use the same exact terminology I used before, which is I'll, I'll say a k-dimensional t coset in this group um, is a is a left coset of this form where this subgroup here is a subgroup generated by k elements of this set t. Is is r prime, or things get weirder if r is not prime? So R does not have to be prime. Um, and um, it, things don't really get weirder, except that there's there's maybe one thing that I'm ignoring, which is, and maybe you can see that when I flip back here, which is that the story I'm telling depends on a choice of a primitive R root of unity. Um, and so in that sense, sort of the ways in which you can make that choice depends on whether R is prime. Um, but once you've made that choice, uh, the story doesn't look different, depending so, on whether R is prime. So in the bottom of this page, that zeta is a is a is a primitive. Exactly. Uh, yep. Exactly. Perfect. Um, yeah. So so here's the theorem. Um, there are dimension preserving and inclusion preserving bijections, again, between the, these three objects. So let me highlight them similarly as I did before, starting in the middle. We've got the faces, or I'm calling them delta faces, just to sort of highlight that they're a little bit um, weird of this uh, polytopal complex, the R permutahedral complex. Um, on the left, I have the boundary strata of this moduli space. And on the right, I have the T cosets in this um, group SRN. Um, so I think this is this is basically a good place to stop. Um, maybe the, the conclusion that I'll say is that the, the way I like to think of this story is that it, it shows that this new moduli space, although it's not toric, it's it's sort of more toric than M0 n bar in the sense that it has an associated polytopal something. It's not a polytope, but it's at least a polytopal complex. Um, and so this leads um, to some some potential follow-up questions. One is sort of like, what sorts of toric properties does it enjoy? So, so maybe sort of the, the, the dream in this direction is like, is it a Mori dream space? Um, or in a, in a sort of related, but sort of different direction, maybe can we describe the chowering of this moduli space in a combinatorial way, um, in the way that you would be able to for either a toric variety or M0 n bar. So, so maybe a more precise version of that question is, is like, can we view this space as a wonderful compactification in some way? Um, but anyway, I think that's, that's probably a good place for me to stop. So thanks for super interesting questions. I'm happy to take more.